Hi, uh, I'm Susie. I'm one of the uh, organisers of the Responsible AI Meetup, and I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, and before we get started, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, we've got a really exciting meetup uh, planned today. This is one we've been uh, quite looking forward to for a while. Catherine and Oshin are absolute um, like dynamos in this space, working together, bringing together the um, uh, philosophy and ethics side of things with the, the practical AI lead and working together, uh, creating uh, some really cool presentations and papers as well. Uh, so big thanks to Catherine and Oshin for coming along today and uh, presenting to us. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to do a shout out or call for shout outs of any, um, anything news that's going on in this space, any, um, anything anyone wants to share to do with ethics and AI, any projects someone's working on and needing collaborators, that kind of a thing. No? Laura? Uh, while we're getting the mic, I'll just mention um, two other things as well. Uh, though some of you might be aware that we, um, oh, I work for Silverpond, and under the Silverpond banner, we're putting out our, doing an ecosystem survey at uh, earlier this year. Um, the results of which will be publicly available. But sort of the key document coming out of that was a report on the ecosystem survey that we're um, submitting to state and federal decision makers. Um, to just really make noise that there is an ecosystem here uh, and it is worth investing in and it should be invested in. Um, so the results of that should be coming out um, within the next day or so. Uh, if anyone's interested in those, I'll post it on the socials as well. Um, but uh, feel free to have a chat to me about that. Um, if you're particularly interested in that um, and wanting to make sure you do get a copy, I can email that through to you. Uh, another thing as well is that we've got an AI and robotics uh, showcase coming up with Melbourne Knowledge Week this year. So on the 26th of May at the Meat Market, which is the Melbourne Knowledge Week hub, uh, there's going to be a range of uh, local uh, startups, universities, uh, companies and entrepreneurs um, showing what they're doing in the space. And it's um, a good place to bring your, uh, your lay AI friends that might not be um, as familiar with, with what's going on. And it's going to be like, very tactile and interactive and you know, give people a really good chance to understand what's going on um, with AI and what's being produced locally. Uh, Laura's got the mic now, so. Hey, uh, was there a question? Did you want me to just say that again? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I'm researching um, with machine learning programmers what kinds of tools might be useful just because like the, the data shows that ethics frameworks don't work, no one reads them, they just don't get involved in like actual practical dev decisions. So I'm doing that research. I'm just trying to think about you know, what is the unit test for ethics? Like, what does it look like? Um, I have no idea. I'm trying to discover it together. Oh, also, Susie is speaking on Bite Into It tonight about that ethics, sorry, that um, research survey that you did. So if you listen to Bite Into It on Triple R, which is a program I speak on as well, Susie will be on that tonight, 7 to 8 o'clock, to talk about the results of that survey, which should be fun. Uh, anyone else got any other announcements that they want to share? Uh, well, before we get started, uh, one other little bit of um, fun time housekeeping. Uh, we've also got the Responsible AI Twitter, and we've just started a Responsible AI YouTube uh, channel. So today's talk will be filmed, and we'll be publishing it on the YouTube channel um, shortly after and promoting that uh, around. So the best place to sort of interact and get on board or if you've got questions is the Twitter handle, which is responsible underscore AI. Um, but yeah, we'll be putting out the YouTube channel and the links to that uh, once that's all, all ready and off the ground. So um, yeah, without any further ado, I might get uh, Oshin and Catherine to come up and begin their presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, so today Catherine and I are going to be talking to you about um, practical and ethical problems with bias in machine learning systems. Uh, so let's start by talking about where to control for bias 
uh, in either humans or machine learning systems. Now, we're going to be talking about natural language processing, we're going to be talking about uh, ethics, but I just want to start by talking a little bit about bias, and in particular, uh, why bias is uh, an ethical problem. So bias, in the sense that I'm going to be talking about and will be talking about today, uh, broadly speaking, is uh, a negative, say, evaluative tendency that we have towards other people uh, based on their apparent membership, at least, uh, in some socially salient category uh, or group. Now, explicit biases are uh, biased attitudes that people have like this uh, that they sort of self-endorse and that they're perfectly happy to have. So, for example, um, a person who is uh, sexist and is perfectly happy to admit that they're sexist. Now, by contrast, implicit biases are biased attitudes that people have that are uh, unconscious, so they're difficult to inhibit, they're difficult to control for, and often they can be in direct conflict with people's explicitly uh, held values. So, for example, uh, somebody might have an implicit sexist bias, even if they uh, explicitly condemn sexism and think that it's uh, wrong. Now, we normally think that uh, biases are uh, bad, so ethically bad or wrong, uh, and when people act on their biases, uh, we think that that's a problem. So normally we hold them accountable, we hold them morally responsible, uh, and we maybe blame them for their uh, actions. And that's okay in the case of explicit bias. It's a little bit more difficult to know what to do in the case of implicit bias, just because people lack the sort of control that you might think they would need to have over how those biases influence their actions, um, such that we can blame them for what they do. But at the very least, what we want to have is some way of controlling for the negative in, uh, influences that uh, biases can have uh, when they're expressed in behavior. So, for example, there can be uh, structural ways of doing this. I'm just trying to indicate this by the violinist uh, picture here. Um, so an example is how biased hiring of male lead violinists uh, in orchestras can be controlled for in a structural way just by having people uh, auditioning for the role uh, audition behind uh, a screen, say, uh, so that the interviewing panel just can't see whether they're uh, a man or a woman. So the upshot uh, for present purposes is that bias in the sense we're talking about is something first that it's bad for any system to have. And we consider it especially bad, secondly, when uh, behavior or outputs are influenced uh, by the bias. And in particular, we want to control for the negative influences of uh, bias uh, on behavior. Now, both uh, human cognitive systems and machine learning systems uh, can have uh, bias in them. Uh, now, in each case, the bias, of course, is learned or acquired from the world. So in the case of humans, in our case, we learn our biases from members of our uh, groups and communities. In the case of machine learning, uh, biases are learned or acquired from the training data that a machine learning model will be trained on. Uh, now that, in the case of natural language processing, is going to be something like millions and millions of uh, natural language texts that are produced by humans. So in the end, the bias still comes from humans because we produce the texts, they're the uh, training data for the model, and then the model acquires the biases in that way. But in each case, uh, a human cognitive system or a machine learning system can have biased uh, outputs. So for example, continuing the example I gave a moment ago, a bunch of white men, uh, even if they explicitly uh, condemn sexism, uh, might nevertheless uh, systematically tend to hire male lead violinists because of an implicit bias that they might have against violinists who are uh, female. And in a now famous example that we're going to talk about more later, um, a word embeddings machine learning uh, natural language processing system might give the uh, output man is to computer programmer uh, as woman is to homemaker, a biased uh, output. So to preview, uh, in a way, our main claim here, uh, we think that it's really hard, as a lot of findings in cognitive science show, uh, to debias human cognitive systems, so to debias ourselves, especially when it comes to implicit bias. Uh, but we think it's also really difficult to debias machine learning systems. And in the human case, it's often most useful to try to control for the negative effects of bias in some actual uh, situation. Uh, so as I pointed out, we can just have violinists uh, perform behind uh, a screen. 
Now, we think that as a general matter, uh, it might be the case that uh, the, these negative effects of bias might best be controlled for uh, in something like this way. When we first of all acknowledge the bias in the system uh, and uh, when we uh, control for it at the level of output in a way that we'll explain more about in a moment. So basically, we think that in the natural language processing case, uh, it may be best to do something uh, analogous, at least, to what we do in the uh, violinist uh, case. And as Catherine will explain later, we actually think that there may be a positive value, sometimes at least, to not uh, debiasing systems. Okay, so I'm going to talk for a moment about descriptive and normative rightness or wrongness, uh, a typical philosophical uh, distinction. So there are two general ways in which we can think about getting things right or wrong or about things being good uh, or bad. One is descriptive and one is normative. So a visual representation of some scene is going to get things descriptively right to the extent that it accurately depicts what is uh, in the scene as presented. And it'll get things descriptively wrong then, of course, to the extent that it fails uh, to do that. So for example, a uh, CCTV camera will get things descriptively right to the extent that it accurately records the face, the image of the face of the person robbing uh, the store. And it'll get things descriptively wrong to the extent that it fails to do that. So, uh, for example, if the exposure settings are off or if there's a smudge on the lens and so on. Now, it's the primary function of something like a camera to get things descriptively right uh, in this sense. Now, by contrast, we expect people to get things normatively right uh, in doing what we think they ethically ought to do. So in the example I've got here, uh, somebody is getting things normatively right by paying for their groceries in the supermarket or whatever, uh, and the person robbing the store over here is getting things uh, normatively wrong uh, in failing to do that and worse, in actually robbing the store. Okay, so how does all of this relate to uh, natural language processing and machine learning systems. So now we're going to talk about a particular natural language processing method uh, called word embeddings. Now word embeddings are learned representations uh, of words that capture or at least come as close as we can yet do to capturing the semantic relationships between words uh, through mathematical relationships between uh, vectors uh, in the system. So they're learned from millions and millions of examples of texts uh, that are produced by us, and so uh, examples of how we humans actually use uh, language. Now, by definition, a good set of representations of this sort is going to accurately reflect the way that we actually use language. And so in this sense, word embeddings actually do a really good job, in a way, uh, of getting things descriptively right in the way that I was talking about a moment ago. Now, maybe they're not the best uh, tool that we might want ultimately for the job, even descriptively, but they're the best we've got, and they're perhaps even surprisingly good in this descriptive sense. But there's a sense in which word embeddings get things uh, normatively wrong. So Bollock Bassey and colleagues in a now famous paper, Man is to Computer Programmer as Woman is to Homemaker, showed that pre-trained sets of word embeddings like glove and word to vec uh, showed that um, uh, well, they, they capture, they seem to capture our use of language so well, in fact, that they capture uh, also our often implicit biases as they're expressed uh, in these texts and in our use of language. And it's interesting to point out here that word embeddings seem to get things normatively wrong in this sense precisely because, or uh, to the extent to which, they get things um, descriptively right. So they get things normatively wrong because they get things uh, descriptively uh, right. So in other words, we've um, uh, got bias in the world, so in the texts that we produce, uh, and the machine learning models uh, are trained on those uh, 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 sets of texts. Uh, and in this sense, because those texts have biases in them that we express, the machine learning system accurately uh, picks up on those uh, biases and reproduces them. Okay, so the question arises then, fine, we've got bias in our system, now uh, what do we uh, do about it? Even though we've acknowledged it's bad, now not bad in the descriptive sense, 
but bad in the normative sense. So here's one thing we could uh, try. We could simply try to debias the world. So we could try to debias ourselves uh, so that then we produce texts that don't have bias in them, and then machine learning models are trained on those texts, uh, and everything is uh, fine. But of course, that's not a practical suggestion in the uh, current context, as much as it might be nice uh, to think about one day living in a world like that. Now, alternatively, we could try to de-bias the system uh, that has already acquired, say, the biases. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is notoriously difficult, as cognitive science shows, in the case of ourselves, in de-biasing our own cognitive uh, systems. And we think that it may not actually be any easier uh, in the case of uh, machine learning systems, which raises, first, a, a practical problem that I'm going to turn it over now to Catherine to explain to you more about. Okay, so <clears throat> in the Bollock Bassi et al. paper, Man is to Computer Programmer as Woman is to Homemaker, the authors came up with a method that allowed them to subtract gender bias from these pre-trained sets of word embeddings. So in the de-biased version, it would just be man is to computer programmer just as woman is to computer programmer. And they claim uh, our algorithms significantly reduce gender bias in embeddings while preserving their useful properties, such as the ability to cluster related concepts and to solve analogy tasks. Uh, we've always been a little bit skeptical about this idea of debiasing word embeddings. First of all, is it even possible to remove all morally relevant bias from these sets of word embeddings? They deal only with gender bias. What about racial bias and other biases? Um, are we not even just going to introduce more biases simply by focusing on certain biases? Um, and secondly, are they really still as useful? Right? Any tweaks that you make to these sets of pre-trained word embeddings is necessarily going to make them descriptively less accurate. Um, certainly that's not going to matter for certain downstream tasks you might want to use them for. Um, but any task that does rely on descriptive accuracy could be negatively affected by these debiased uh, versions of the embeddings. Well, on the question of whether it's even possible to remove the bias, uh, it seems that, in fact, even in the case of gender bias, it's not that simple. Uh, a very recent paper was just uh, came out in March this year called Lipstick on a Pig, shows that this debiasing method uh, just masks the problem. It doesn't actually get rid of it. So the authors, Gunnan and Goldberg, found that while the bias is indeed uh, substantially reduced, the actual effect is mostly hiding the bias, not removing it. So when it comes to words that should be gender neutral but aren't, so words, for example, stereo stereotypically male professions and stereotypically female professions, what they found was while it's superficially true that these words now are no longer closer to man than to woman, they're still closer to each other. They're still clustering together. So you have stereotypically male professions here and stereotypically female professions here. And it's actually possible to recover the gender information from these supposedly debiased word embeddings. So we're not saying don't tackle bias. We're saying don't tackle it here. Right? Instead, focus on the actual application using things like word embeddings. Figure out how bias manifests itself in that application and control for its negative effects. But exactly how you control for it is going to depend entirely on the application in question. Okay, so now we'll look at a few actual examples of NLP applications. Machine translation. This is widely regarded as probably the greatest success story in natural language processing, and rightly so. Um, here, we're no longer talking about pre-trained sets of word embeddings. These types of systems are typically trained end-to-end, -end, so word representations would be learned as part of a larger task. Now, pronouns are notoriously difficult for machine translation. This is Douglas Hofstadter, cognitive scientist. Um, he recently wrote about what he calls the shallowness of Google Translate, pointing to its inability to actually understand what it's translating. Uh, and a lot of the examples he gives are mistranslations of pronouns. The reason pronouns are so difficult for machine translation is that in order to be able to, under, to translate a pronoun correctly, 
you need to understand what it's actually referring to. Um, and with gendered pronouns, you really see the problem very clearly. Um, so some languages don't have gendered pronouns. Uh, languages like French have, so the possessive pronoun, the gender agrees with the noun, not the possessor as in English. And that's what this example here is illustrating. But gendered pronouns are probably where uh, machine translation systems really kind of show off their bias. You've probably, many of you I'm sure will have seen examples of Turkish sentences translated into English. So Turkish doesn't have gendered pronouns, um, and, but when they're translated into English, they, you know, the gender of the pronoun that's chosen, it's chosen according to the noun. So it'll be he for a doctor, she for a nurse, etc. Given the problem that pronouns pose for machine translation systems, how about just not letting the system output a gendered pronoun at all because it's going to just expose its biases? Instead, you have a user of the application there enlist their help in actually choosing the correct pronoun. That might seem needlessly complicating things in the case of, you know, where the, where the noun is really obvious, like mother, brother, or sister. But as it turns out, even given a massive hint about what the gender of a pronoun should be, in this case, sister, um, even state-of-the-art machine translation gets it embarrassingly wrong. Now, we actually gave a version of this talk to Google last year in July, I think. And we made this exact recommendation to them. We said, like, don't let it output a gendered pronoun. It's just going to expose its biases, and it's going to give incorrect translations that the user is going to have to correct. Why not make it easy for them? Um, well, in December of last year, Google announced gender-specific translations to reduce gender bias in Google Translate. So now if you put in Obir Doktor, the Turkish, um, it gives the user a choice. He is a doctor or she is a doctor. Um, much as we'd love to take credit for a big change that Google made to their Translate app, uh, the reality is probably that this, kind, this discussion was ongoing. It was a work in progress, and we probably just provided some support, at least, for one side of the argument. And it's a shame that they didn't actually uh, implement the change properly, and it amounts to little more than lipstick on a pig. Because, sure, when you're saying, oh, beer doctor, there's no incorrect answer, because there's no context. So, sure, he is a doctor, she is a doctor, pick whichever one you want. But if you do provide context, give it some real text, like, did you meet John's sister, she is a doctor, you can try this yourselves. Put in, have you met John's sister, she is a doctor, translate it into Turkish and back to English, and you'll get the pronoun flipped to he is a doctor. Or if you do, have you met John's brother, he is a nurse, translate it into Turkish, back to English, you'll get she is a nurse. So, right where it actually matters, uh, they're not doing this gender-specific translation. So they're exposing bias still and getting the translation wrong. Uh, so it's kind of a double fail and makes this change seem kind of meaningless. Okay, so translation is an example of a natural language generation task, right? These are tasks where the output is going to be a sentence or sentences in natural language. Other examples are speech recognition, image captioning, uh, and dialogue systems. And a naive approach to systems like this might be to say, we don't want these systems ever to output something that is sexist or racist. But if you look at speech recognition, for example, if the input to a speech recognition system is somebody uttering the words, a proper wife should be as obedient as a slave, these wise words came from Aristotle, apparently, um, the only correct output uh, in the case of speech recognition is the text, a proper wife should be as obedient as a slave. Right? There's no room there for us to impose any kind of normative correctness. With translation, it's a little bit more flexible because, of course, for any given uh, phrase in the uh, source text, there are multiple correct ways of translating it in the target language. Um, but again, there's still no room for normative correctness here. The output has to be a correct translation of this sexist phrase. With image ha captioning, we do start to see some, some room for normative uh, correctness. So there, obviously there's tons of different ways that a given image could be captioned suitably. Um, somebody might suggest that a suitable caption for this image would be a disobedient wife. But we would certainly hope that no 
uh, image captioning system would ever suggest uh, a, a caption like that for this image. And then again, with dialogue systems, there are multiple correct ways to respond to a given input or question. Um, but if somebody were to ask a dialogue system how obedient should a proper wife be, one would hope the system would not reply a proper wife should be as obedient as a slave. So what was the only correct output in the case of speech recognition should never be output in the case of a dialogue system. So it's really clear that these different applications need to be treated differently. Search is a very different application. Um, so this, there was a, a case a while back of somebody doing an image search for the phrase three black teenagers and then doing a search for the phrase three white teenagers. And they got drastically different results. So primarily mugshots for the phrase three black teenagers and primarily uh, stock photos of smiling teenagers for, for three white teenagers. Now, what was the person actually looking for? What were they using this application for? <clears throat> well, it turns out they were actually just trying to make a point. They were asking, is Google racist? And they were using these image results to confirm, yes, Google is racist. But what if somebody else uh, was asking a different question? Somebody who knows that you know, has some idea of how search works and that it is, to a, to a great extent, a reflection of how people are talking on the internet. Um, and they just wanted to know, is there racial bias in how crime is reported on in the media? <coughs> they could use these exact same results as confirmation of that hypothesis. But if Google had somehow managed to change it so that you got a perfectly equal number of mugshots versus smiling stock photos for both of these searches, that person would have walked away thinking all is right with the world, when in fact it's not. I did a search of my own a while back. I did put in a search for female engineers. Curious to see if there are problematic ways that people talk about female engineers as opposed to any other kind of engineer. Um, and of the 10 or so autocomplete results I got, three of them had something to do with a bridge. So there was this bridge, pedestrian bridge in Florida that collapsed. Um, people were killed, um, and it turns out there was a theory during the rounds that the bridge had been designed by an all-female engineering team. It was total rubbish, but people were talking about it, uh, and so that's why it was coming up here in these search results, uh, in these autocomplete suggestions. And so my instinct was, uh, you know, I wanted to click on that report inappropriate predictions button, because I couldn't help imagining like a young girl doing a search like that because maybe she's thinking, you know, engineering might be the right career for me. Are female engineers a thing? Um, and then coming up against this kind of rubbish. Um, but I didn't press that button in the end because well, I thought, well, it did answer my question. I was wondering, are there problematic ways that people talk about female engineers on the internet? And yes, sure enough, there are. And it's useful for me to know about that. So search is a very different application from machine translation. With machine translation, it's really easy to answer the question, what should the output be? The output should be a correct translation into the target language of the source text. In the case of search, it's really not that clear. Should the output reflect a world that is not the world we live in, but the world we would like to live in, sort of normatively correct search results? Uh, or should it reflect the world that we have with all of its problematic biases? You know, you could maybe have uh, a disclaimer on the autocomplete results box saying, this is what the internet is talking about right now, but please be advised it could be garbage. Um, but we think that there is value to not debiasing representations of human thoughts. For one thing, it allows us to examine these biases more closely. Um, but it also stops us from thinking that all is right with the world when it isn't. But we are aware that this raises an ethical dilemma. So if we don't debias representations, sure, we get to retain descriptive accuracy and provide ethically useful information, but we do run the risk of amplifying bias. If, on the other hand, we debias representations, we don't amplify bias but we lose that descriptive accuracy and withhold ethically useful information. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Oshin to wrap up. Okay, so let's uh, wrap things up. Uh, so what do we do 
then about bias in uh, natural language processing machine learning systems. So we think that this comes down basically to a, uh, uh, or comes down to a more basic uh, question, which is what do we want from these uh, systems? Uh, do we want these systems to be more like cameras in the way that I outlined earlier on, uh, or do we want them to be more like people? So we expect cameras to get things uh, descriptively right, but not uh, normatively right. Now, by contrast, we typically expect people to get things normatively right. Now, even if that means that in some sense they get things descriptively wrong. So, for example, we're not going to excuse somebody from making a sexist comment, even if it's true that they're making that sort of comment is an accurate, descriptively accurate reflection of how language is in fact used, let's say, in their sexist uh, language community. Here, we're going to want that person to get things normatively right by not making that sort of, um, uh, uh, by not saying that sort of sexist remark. Okay, uh, so the question here is, should we expect natural language processing systems uh, to get things normatively right? Uh, so that, as in the example in this picture, they translate out things that we simply don't want to hear for whatever reason. Uh, or is it enough for these systems to instead get things uh, descriptively right, uh, like cameras, so that they tell us how things actually are and then let us decide what to do about it in some particular context or in some particular use case? Now, we think that there is some uh, value, at least in some cases, uh, in having natural language processing systems function more like cameras and getting things descriptively right. Uh, now, for one thing, it can, in some cases, provide people with ethically useful information in the way that Catherine uh, described uh, a moment ago, so that a young girl here, uh, for example, uh, will know accurately what she, in fact, faces in her goal, let's say, of uh, becoming uh, an engineer. But as Catherine pointed out, too, we acknowledge that there's a dilemma, uh, because allowing a system to uh, get things descriptively right in this way uh, runs the risk of amplifying bias by just uh, repeating uh, biased expressions. Now, we think it's just going to have to be something that we decide case by case uh, when it comes to deciding which way to go here, whether we debias the representations uh, or not. But we want to draw attention, at least uh, here today, to something that doesn't seem that intuitive to people from the outset, which is that there can be some cases where there really is a value uh, to not uh, debiasing these systems. Um, and there can be a positive value, in fact, at, at, to doing that. Uh, and what we do here is instead um, just try to control for the negative effects uh, that there might be from the bias uh, at the particular uh, application level or use case uh, uh, in question. Okay, I think that's all we've got for you, so thanks very much. Hi. Um, I have bias against politicians. I also have bias against bankers, but nothing they will do to change that. And I also look at your slides about descriptive, nomadic, using CCTV. And there was a case uh, reported two days ago about this man, 35 years old. He helped a young girl, 20 years old, at a petrol station fixing her car. And later on, um, when the car was fixed, the man actually followed her just to make sure she got the car right, and the car broke down again. And later on, she called the police and said that he was stalking her and make a proposition to her. He was arrested and put into maximum prison system for two weeks. And he was represented by a female lawyer, and she pressed and the police to interview her again and again. And then the young girl broke down and cried and said she'd make it up. So using what you just said to me, descriptive and nomadic, and the CCTV will have given evidence that this man actually followed her. But uh, the evidence later on showed that this young girl, she was making up, and he went into prison for nothing. Can I just say a couple of things to start? Yeah. Um, so the... 
I'm trying to remember, there was a number of things there, in fact. So uh, the first part of what you said, oh yeah, biased against politicians and so on. Look, in the, bias is just a preference, right? I'm biased uh, in favor of carrots over peas, right? Uh, so I like them, and I don't like peas, maybe. Uh, so bias, broadly speaking, is just a preference. There's nothing wrong with being biased in that sense. The sense in which there's something normatively wrong with being biased is when you make an evaluative judgment of a person solely and only based on their apparent membership in some socially salient category or group, as I said earlier on. So that's the relevant kind of bias here. So being biased against a politician in some uh, context where you treated uh, a, pol a politician differentially and less well than somebody else, but only because they were a politician, I think it's arguably uh, wrong, in fact. As biased as we all might be in some sense but against my politicians. But there's the mechanism to protect myself against sure. a politician who lie all the time. But without yeah. that, I'd be very vulnerable. Okay, well, uh, in any case, I think that uh, any heuristic or uh, safety mechanism of this sort that somebody might have, uh, if it uh, permits them to do something that, in fact, we all agree is ethically wrong, then it's not a justifiable uh, heuristic or uh, practice. In any case, we can talk about that afterwards if you want. In relation to the second example, I'm not really sure that I followed all the details or the inferences that you were trying to make, uh, but I can say this. Um, it's normatively wrong to stalk somebody. It's normatively wrong to um, accuse somebody wrongly if that ever occurs uh, under these sorts of circumstances. Uh, I mean, we can agree, I think, about all those kinds of judgments. If we had accurate descriptive information about the entire sequence of events here, so there's some eye in the sky, some drone following the entire sequence of events, then there would be no ambiguity about uh, what happened. And of course, that actually speaks to our point. Uh, the more descriptive accuracy we have in general from various systems in the world, uh, the more we can um, decide ourselves then properly what to do in, in particular uh, uh, contexts. So I think that's about all I want to really say about uh, that example. Unless you have something to add, I think we'll probably go to the next question. So how do you uh, show what biases could be in these systems so you can counter them? So I know there's a bit of work on data statements. I don't know if there's anything else that you think of that can make it clear the sort of things that you should be debiasing against at the system level. Because we don't always know when they're biased, and you don't know what might be in there. Do you have an example of an application that you would be... I mean, I think it really kind of always matters uh, what application you're working with. So, like, in the sort of standard type examples where we see bias at its worst is things like um, uh, loan applications where they're somehow biased against people from particular neighborhoods or biased against... Uh, people belonging to particular categories. And at least in that sense, you know that the data you're working with is data about people. Um, and there are various tools out there that allow you to uh, establish whether in fact your system is, you know, whether you want to use one of the 25 different definitions of fairness, but how, how exactly you want to do that. Um, of course, there's always a tension then between privacy and uh, wanting to prove fairness because with certain Systems, you might not even have access to the data about people's race and gender because it's protected classes, and yet you're being asked to prove that it's fair uh, to all classes. So that is um, a bit of a difficulty, um, but there are some mechanisms uh, that have been put forward involving like having a third party that has access to the data and can sort of deliver, a, can, can actually sort of certify a system as being fair with, in relation to these groups. I'm not sure if that answers your question. I, I guess it was the second part that I was thinking about when you don't have that information to be able to say you're biased. So yeah. I guess the third party is one way. Thank you. Um, a question. Um, I, I like the, um, the, the example of the, the camera because you've got the means to ca capture an observable fact without any sort of adjustment or manipulation of that. But we all know that, that observable facts such as pictures can be uh, misinterpreted when they're in the wrong context. For example, um, you know, a, a Nazi slogan in the context of um, clamping down on that sort of propaganda is would be a good thing versus the opposite um, case. So it strikes me that it's entirely a function of context. And rather than having an assumed context, which will give you in, invariably a wrong result or a skewed result, 
how, how best can you cater for more explicit context to then drive the inference in the right direction? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's important to point out that the, the camera is just given as an example of showing this idea of descriptive accuracy. Um, sure, but even in the camera example, I think you're right that, I mean, if that was actually capturing uh, people practicing for a stage production, uh, then obviously this is just an actor and they're not doing anything normatively wrong, right? Yeah, sure. So context, I think, even in the camera case. But you're right, it's an it's a analogy here. Yeah. So, yeah, what, I'm not sure exactly what the, the question is, but how, how to deal with context in general in... Or yes, so how best can you deal with context, the, the, the variable of context? Because it strikes me that's, that's a significant driver to the quality of the result that you're, you're going to get. Right? Okay, so, so my answer is how, to how best to deal with context is have a human in the loop. Uh, certainly in the case of natural language understanding, um, that, you know, humans are the ultimate sense makers of language. Uh, we're still lacking common sense reasoning in any natural language understanding system. Um, so when it comes to actually understanding context, humans are the only ones able to do that. So where context really, really matters, um, you bring a human into the loop. I think I would broadly speaking want to agree with that and say that even in the toy example of the camera, uh, that sort of uh, worry about how to interpret the uh, descriptive findings such that you're actually getting descriptive accuracy uh, that just can't be done by a machine yet, and it's uh, implausible to me that we're anywhere close to that uh, at the moment. And you do have to, I think, have a human interpreter in there somewhere. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, quick question. Your recommendation to uh, control for bias at the application level, if you were, for example, doing a loan application and you identified a bias uh, based on the suburb of the applicant, and you controlled for that at the application level, what would that look like? Is that a rule to say that we ignore that inference from that suburb? Or what would practically? OK, so I think in that case, the application includes everything, like the data itself. So it's not, like, it's not the same as when you're talking about these like pre-trained learned representations or this type of thing. Um, so by all means, uh, in the case of if you are dealing with data about people, that is a, a system that's making decisions that affect people, um, I, I, I think it's, it's fairly clear you have to, you have to deal with it. Uh, like dealing with it in the data itself um, is, is the obvious way to go in, a, in an example like that, where there's this like, direct relationship between the data being trained on and the data and, and the um, decisions being made about people. Yeah, in a longer version of this talk, we uh, cite a couple of other examples uh, of sort of easier to control for problems with bias in data. One was uh, an example from Nature last year where researchers at Stanford had uh, claimed that they had a, a machine learning model that could identify skin cancer as accurately as a dermatologist, right? Uh, but it turned out that they had only uh, trained their model on uh, predominantly images of uh, skin lesions on white skin, so it was not going to be able to predict uh, whether a, a lesion was cancerous or not on anything except white skin. Uh, but you know, there, in principle, it's a really easy problem to solve. You just get better data. So there are all these kinds of different uh, use cases where sometimes it's just going to be an issue about getting better data. Um, uh, and in other cases, I think the word embeddings one and similar examples are interesting because of what I mentioned at one point where it seems like uh, the success of the thing depends on it actually reproducing the bias because it's only because it's doing so well that it actually picks up on the biases that we have hidden in there uh, in, the, in the training data. Hey, um, thanks for that great talk. Uh, I'm curious if either of you have any um, gut feelings or suggestions about how to do the work of deciding what to do when the, there isn't a clear normative case, like when there, there are like questions about what is, what is the right path forward or what is the right way to reduce bias or how much, like how much to push on the lever. Um, and like there's, there's so many examples, like even, even keeping in medicine, um, you might be doing say an MRI to look for a certain kind of cancer and you're trying to train an image classifier to predict whether that, that like cancer exists in that patient. One way of sort of optimizing would be to try and get as many possible patients through and test them for that cancer. So say like, we're not too worried about accuracy, but we really, really want to prevent harm. That's our, that's a normative task. But then another one might be, we really want high accuracy. So you maybe want much smaller 
sort of patient group but have the most like strong confidence that that cancer actually exists. So when you have those kinds of questions like how do you how do you resolve them how, or do you have any sorry that's a terrible question how do you do you have any suggestions on how you might tackle that question internally in a team? Well so I mean I would totally agree with you that focusing on harms is is absolutely um, kind of essential and you want to kind of figure out what are going to be the negative effects or what are going to be what's what are the stakes of a bad decision right so in in any particular case you want to see what well, what's the harm that can come from a false positive what's the harm that can come from a false negative um, and then even if you were to focus on what's well, all about accuracy you have to think about well by definition these systems are uncertain there are going to be wrong answers um, and it may just be one or two wrong answers, but if the stakes, if, if that is going to lead to a very, very bad outcome, even for one person, um, you know, in the case, of, certainly in the case of healthcare applications, um, but then with other types of systems, it, the, the stakes aren't that high, um, and so you might be able to trade off a little bit um, in, a, in focusing on accuracy and being okay with, uh, you know, one or two false negatives or false positives or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, everything. Uh, you said there about the stakes, but I also wanted to add that, you know, we acknowledge that there's a dilemma at the end, right? So uh, sometimes we're saying there can be uh, a value in not debiasing representations in various applications, um, but then we run the risk, at least the risk of, say, amplifying bias, okay, especially when it comes to search. And in some cases, we're going to say that the harm that might uh, accrue to amplifying bias in that case is just it outweighs any advantage we might think there would be to retaining the bias in the system and then uh, trying to control for it somehow else. So uh, we, we, we said it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis deciding whether we debias or uh, try to debias at least, as much as we can, uh, or not debias. And it's going to be this trade-off between, uh, on a given, uh, in a given case, is there going to be uh, more disvalue, more harm perhaps caused by uh, not debiasing uh, or, or is there some positive advantage to, to retaining the bias in the system? But these issues about the stakes are also really important. So healthcare is a classic example where uh, you want to avoid that. Yeah. Um, I was uh, just going to ask, a, a, it's maybe a how do you feel about this kind of a question, right? So we normally hold these AI solutions to try and say we don't want them to be biased, yet we readily acknowledge that they're biased because they're trained on data coming from humans which are biased. We suggested that if we can't sort of work out what that bias, what the unbiased answer should be, we should put a human in the loop, knowing full well that that human will bring their own bias to the equation. I mean, at the end of the day, should we be trying to build a, a solution which is in a global context deemed to be not biased, uh, when we know that the bias and the perception of bias is you know, based on your cultural norms which differ all over the world, and so one solution will be right in one place and wrong in another. How do, you, how do you feel about that whole paradigm? Because I just the human in the loop thing just sort of feels like an easy escape from the whole question of I can't get sort of a globally standardized answer to this. Well, so this reminds me of the moral machine, uh, the MIT sort of study. It was set up as the, the trolley problem for self-driving cars. Like you're presented with all these examples of what, you sh what should you do in this scenario? Should the self-driving car mow down pedestrians or mow down uh, one old person or whatever. And the study was really a study in values across different cultures because they found, um, you know, they ran this and like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people kind of responded um, and they found that across different countries, people value other people in different ways. Like um, in certain cultures, older people were, were always saved. They, they were valued far more highly than in other cultures. Um, so that certainly brings a, a sort of tricky uh, angle to the question. But at least in the case, if you're, if you're talking about human in the loop, um, if you're talking about the human as the user of the application, the, hu the, the human as the user that the application is being deployed on, at least it's serving their interests. Um, and so you're not talking about a human having, uh, you know, then kind of, um, allowing their biases to affect other people. So it, all, it really always depends on what the actual application is. Right? And in fact, the, the uh, Balak Bassi and colleagues uh, uh, suggestion for debiasing is called hard debiasing. Uh, these uh, natural language processing machine learning systems, uh, the word embedding systems, 
brings humans into the loop in a way in the wrong place because humans are brought into the loop there as a way of trying to uh, de-bias some of the representations. Uh, and there you're changing the model uh, and you're also running the risk of uh, inadvertently introducing bias uh, through these people directly into it. But broadly speaking, I mean, you're, I think I took your broad point to be that how do we decide what normative uh, rightness is? There's no camera for that, right? Uh, my job as a philosopher uh, involved in ethics would be a lot easier if I could find that camera and then just report it back to everybody. Uh, so you're going to get cultural variation. You're going to get variation uh, culturally within our own cultures sometimes about what the right answer uh, here is. As in all of these cases, we have to start from the clear cases, right? Uh, when I teach this kind of stuff to my undergraduate students, you know, we can all basically agree, or I become very worried if we can't agree, that like stabbing babies in the eye unnecessarily and killing them just for the sport of it is wrong, right? So we start from those cases and we work towards the more problematic ones, uh, like abortion or whatever it is. Uh, so yes, we have to be careful in uh, assuming that what we prejudge as normative correctness, especially on some of the more controversial types of judgments, uh, is something that we then have to implement. Um, by all means, I, I, I take that point. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, just following from the previous question, um, so I work with intelligent assistants and primarily with users because I'm, I'm in part of a UX team. And we have found that, in fact, some users want to inject biases into their assistance because it's, because it's part of their preferences. So, for instance, if they're shopping for a certain uh, type of food or they want to watch certain type of news, they actually say, you know, I want to filter out all this stuff because I, I don't like it, even though it's not um, maybe you know, not normatively correct. So that's something that we find because if we are using ML to create systems that helps the human, and the human is being, being the driver, uh, for some systems, there's going to be inherent biases. And you know, even in, you know, like you said, in different cultures, that becomes even more, more prominent. Because I work in, in, in Japan as well as in Australia. So uh, we do find some differences between um, the two different cultures. Any thoughts about that? Uh, for some reason, Tay comes to mind. Um, but like, but the example you're giving is a human wanting to kind of specify their preferences for their interactions with this system, right? Yeah. That's not going to, one would hope, that's not going to affect anybody else's interactions with the system. Whereas in the case of, of Tay, um, you had users interacting with this Microsoft Twitter bot, um, and their interactions with Tay certainly did affect other everybody's interactions with Tay. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's like, I suppose an interesting question would be, um, you know, how bad would it be if the people who interacted with Tay in that kind of way, if it had just been in their own little private instance of Tay and nobody ever else ever had to see it, um, would it still matter as much? Because um, as long as, I mean, everyone's going to express their preferences and want these kinds of systems to work better for them, but as long as their preferences only affect their interactions, um, seems like a reasonable way to... It, it does. There might be a caveat on that, though. I mean, if I'm a racist uh, and I'm trying to optimize some system that I'm interacting with to, you know, be more racist with me or something, uh, like then, <laughs> yeah, like Tay, uh, but even if it's just in the private context where it's not influencing other uh, users, mm. I think that's problematic, uh, perhaps, right? Uh, but it's a less clear case than, say, Tay or something. Um, so there may be some, some uh, normative problem in there, too. But, yeah. um. Uh, thank you very much to Catherine and Oshin um, for a really good uh, presentation uh, and amazing questions and answers. We're going to wrap it up, all the formal uh, proceedings for the meetup. Um, I know a lot of people have got to be getting back to work and whatnot, but if uh, you've got a bit more of a looser schedule, please uh, stay and continue to chat. Um, there's some really good conversations going on at the start of the meetup, um, and Catherine and Oshin might be around for a little bit longer for any more questions. Uh, in the meantime, jump onto Twitter and uh, this. Uh, the video from the, today will be on uh, YouTube and we'll be putting that out on Twitter. Uh, the hashtag, uh, the handle is responsible underscore AI. Um, another thing as well that I meant to mention earlier, uh, James uh, from Eliza uh, has, has been putting together this fantastic podcast called um, AI Australia, uh, and of which Catherine and O'Sheen are uh, guests of the recent episode. So uh, make sure you check that out. They've had some other really fantastic guests such as Tim Miller and Ellen Broad. So if you're really interested in that, 
uh, ethics, AI space, and, um, and podcasts. It's a really good combination of the two. Um, so thank you very much for coming today, and we'll see you at the next meetup.